Dr. Nishi and Dr. Lakshmi, all are from GMC Kottayam. Um, since uh, the blindness uh, due to glaucoma is um, totally preventable, uh, it is imperative for the general ophthalmologist to have a, an idea of basic workup so that we can treat the glaucoma at an early t in time and uh, thereby you can prevent the blindness due to glaucoma. So the purpose of uh, this course is uh, we will give an overall idea of basic how to work a patient, work upon a, pa a patient with glaucoma or to diagnose glaucoma and treat the glaucoma. And now I welcome Dr. Thomas George. He is working as senior consultant at uh, of glaucoma and uh, cataract, the um, Chaitanya Hospital uh, Trivandrum, for his uh, keynote address, Rational Diagnosis in Glaucoma. Over to you, Thomas. Uh, thank you, Vijayama. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I will be taking you through a few cases to highlight uh, few points that I consider as important in diagnosis of glaucoma. So one is, first of all, glaucoma is a progressive disease and one is never sure that we have diagnosed glaucoma until you show a progression. It has to be documented. And things can change over time. So every visit, please revisit the history and examination, even during follow-up and not just do an IOP, do a field and keep them going on for years. Revisit the findings when there's any change or at least once a year. First, I'll go through a 55-year-old person who has uh, got a transferable job on treatment for glaucoma already for five years when I saw him. And it was noted by a general ophthalmologist and referred to a specialist at 50 years of age. IOP was historically 40 and diagnosis angle closure and both eyes laser PI was done. This were noted to be 0.5 and one is advanced with 0.9 cup at that point in time itself. And no treatment for intraocular pressure was there after that. And uh, IOP was 10 within one month. And there was a, some sort of a communication gap and he never went for any follow-up during the next couple of years. He got transferred, he needs new glasses. So he goes to get checked, 30 pressures both eyes again. And once again, a glaucoma specialist is roped in and as per the medical report, the fields were the same as before. That's two years, no obvious progression on fields. IOP was 12 with the specialist, but because the 30 was recorded, he enlarged the PIs in both eyes anyway. And subsequently, he was put on brimondin and dorsolomide drops and intraocular pressure was 10 to 14 for next two years. But according to the patient, during that enlargement of the PI, after that, he had severe headache and vomiting, etc. Went back to the hospital, pressures of 50, which was managed with IV and oral treatment. All this was not there in the medical report. And subsequently, he was started on medical therapy. Another two years, Newtown, and he is surprised with another intraocular pressure of 20. Feels are still the same. He is diagnosed as chronic angle closure and advised surgery in both eyes. When people are doing surgery, they always seek a second opinion. So this time when he came to Trivandrum for his holidays, he came to me and vision was 6-6, IOP was 10 both eyes on Brimondin and Dorsolomide, two patent POIs each in the two eyes and fields were the same right through. All, all three fields with them were the same. PI was patent and the angles were closed. As you can see, the gonioscopy you can see uh, below the Schwalbe's line is not seen, it's fully close. But on indentation, you look at the second picture, there's a plateau iris, there's a sine wave sign, the angle is capable of opening all the way. So I decided to try pilocarpin, he was put on 2% pilocarpin. Luckily, the patient is happy with the pinhole effect and he says he doesn't need glasses to read near anymore. And pressure is 10 mm. Subsequently, we withdrew the Brahmondin and Dorsolomite and gonioscopy was open angles, the pressures were 10. So, 
Gonoscopy is one examination that I cannot emphasize enough. Everybody needs to know how to do gonoscopy. Gonoscopy is needed for closure. Everybody knows that. But mind you, the sensitivity of Van Herricks is only around 60%. It's a poor predictor for angle closure glaucoma. And it doesn't tell you that the angle is open if the Van Herricks is showing a wide angle. You need gonio to show an open angle to even diagnose a primary open angle glaucoma. It's an open angle glaucoma. You have to show that it's open. 90% of the secondary glaucoma, the diagnosis hinges on your gonoscopy findings. Every ophthalmologist needs to know how and do applanation and gonoscopy. Not good enough to know. You have to do it. One needs to see at least 100 normal angles to figure out what normal is to start identifying pathology with reasonable sense, uh, certainty in gonoscopy is not just for glaucoma. There are other findings in the angle which we may pick up for other diseases also. Uh, peripheral nodules, keratic precipitates, peripheral cornea is better seen from the behind rather than in front because you may have a wide arcus. All that's there. So I go on to the next patient I would like to highlight and that is a 61 year old diabetic, ischemic heart disease and hypertensive. He had a septic shock post RTA road traffic accident at 45 at age of 45 years and on follow up with no treatment with a diagnosis of possible NTG or a one time vascular event that happened in the hypotensional septic shock. So cup disc ratio, there's a notch, it's an advanced glaucoma again and dense superior arc with scotomas but the pressure is being low 10 to 14. He was just being followed up looking for a progression on no treatment and the fields were stable every six months we kept doing the fields and for about 10 years nothing has happened. Then suddenly he pops up with a pressure of 28 in both eyes. Gonioscopy shows a fully open angle, it's not a closure. So we dig into history, it took quite some time and reluctantly he let out that he's been on treatment for a skin disease, eczema with skin creams and uh, Possible steroid response is suspected. Medical therapy was anyway started because the pressures are high and steroids are stopped and eventually in three to four months the IOP is expected to come down and we may be able to pull out of medical therapy also. So revisit history whenever required. Next I go into a 71 year old diabetic for 12 years, hypertensive for 5 years on treatment with POAG for last 30 years and pilocarpine was drug of choice of POAG treatment in the past and he was happy on it so it has never changed. So his pupils are never really dilatable and uh, suddenly the 14 to 18 pressure which he was going on became 34 in one eye. And there you are, we made a mistake there because we missed the diabetic retinopathy till he threw an angle neovascularization. The good side of the thing is we stopped pilo, dilated him and uh, did a PRP and he's okay. There's a fourth patient that I would like to take you through. This is actually a foreigner. Is She is on treatment at 28 years of age with Travapros for 4 years already. That means 24 years of age she was diagnosed as primary opening glaucoma based on fields having a superior arc with scotoma in one eye. Historically, she says even those uh, pressures were only 16 at diagnosis. It's very rare for a young person to have a normal pressure and glaucoma. That itself is a red flag, but the patient is on treatment. And now when I see pressure is 14 in both eyes, open angles, and the disc looked normal to me. And this is an OCT. And one eye has got an OCT marked abnormal, and the other eye is absolutely normal. But I'd like to show you OCT of the right eye done again. Can I have a pointer? See, the problem is the segmentation. It's the same scan of the same patient on the same day. Unfortunately, I don't know the point. I'll just walk over. Out here, the segmentation has gone wrong and it's gone red out here. And one segment has gone red. The same pictures are. The segmentation is correct and the, the same segment comes out as green. Anyway, I'm through with Thank you. So 
So this is what it is. The segmentation went wrong there. Same thing, same picture and the graph hits. Whenever the graph hits the baseline down, you have to be suspicious of the OCT. So now we have a patient with normal disc fields and OCT, stop the prostaglandin analogs. Usually the effect wears off within one week, one week down the line, she is okay on the pressure side and she has promised to come back to India once she is off treatment for about six months as well. And <clears throat> I don't expect her to be become a POAG at this age. So I expect the pressure then also to be normal. So based on a single field, the patient was put on treatments. So investigations can have errors. Do not diagnose and treat individual findings on examination or individual findings on investigations. Do not, this is something that I find a lot of hospitals are doing, do not outsource IOP to technicians. They are very reluctant to record a out of normal range uh, pressure. So they will repeat and repeat and repeat and some place they will get an erroneous normal reading and for three months you will be thinking the pressure is normal. We need to diagnose patient on the overall patient profile and the glaucoma is a dy dynamic disease and until we see progression we are never sure that has to be at the back of your mind. So we keep revisiting the diagnosis on follow up. Sometimes we may need to tell our patient much down the line once his long learning curve on fields goes through and the patient suddenly throws up a normal field two years down the line that we probably were wrong the start with and we can try cutting down on treatment. There is uh, no shame in that. That is the right way to go about it. You do not want side effects of treatment either. So <clears throat> I go on to the next one. 70 year old on treatment for glaucoma for 15 years with a combination of brimodin and timolol for NTG. 12 and 14 pressures, open angles, this is suspicious all right and dense uh, scotomas on fields, practically one eyed. Once again, this is a foreign patient. We get a lot of Mali patients in Chaitanya. So these are all diagnosed there. The, can I have one more minute? This dense uh, scotomas on one eye, even the other eye has got scotomas in the awkward area. But when you go to the OCT, th this looks bad, one sector is gone, but look at the segmentation, there is something else going on there. The internal limiting membrane is taking off into the vitreous and the other segmentation comes down here, there is something else going on there. And this is what the patient had, toxoplasma scars. And based on fields, the patient has been put on treatment. Now the flip side is the patient is convinced he has gone blind with glaucoma. So I have difficulty, I do not know if he will stop treatment. His son is convinced though and I hope he comes back to me three weeks down the line of treatment to check if the pressures are actually normal. So in, in short, treat the whole patient, not the single uh, findings, temporal sequence of events may modify one's plan, gonoscopy and fundus examination are key to diagnosis and management. History is not just for the start, revisit as and when required at least once a year. Thank you. Thank you sir for the elaborate and informative talk on the intricacies of glaucoma diagnosis. A few points I would like to enlighten is that a glaucomatologist should be a good counsellor. There is no hurry in treating the, uh, starting the treatment, but you have to counsel the patient about the continuation of treatment once you started the drug. That is very important. And also still pilocarpine has a role in the treatment of glaucoma as sir mentioned. And thank you sir for the enlightening the importance of gonioscopy in the diagnosis of glaucoma. Thank you, sir. Now let us invite Dr. Lakshmi, uh, Assistant Professor, Government Medical College, Kottayam. His uh, her topic is uh, Essentials of Tonometry. Good morning. 
Thank you, madam, for this opportunity. So I'll be dealing with some essential points in tonometry. So intraocular pressure, as you know, is a fine-tuned equilibrium between the production of aqueous, the drainage of aqueous, and the episcleral venous pressure. The normal IOP is generally considered between 10 to 21, but remember that it is a dynamic measurement, just like a heart rate or blood pressure. And various studies have shown that half of all individuals with open angle glaucomas can have IOPs below 21. But still, we need to measure the IOP because it is the only significantly modifiable risk factor for glaucoma, which affects both the onset as well as progression of glaucoma. Now, the quantitative assessment of intraocular pressure using a calibrated instrument is tonometry. Now, depending on the mechanism, various types of tonometers are available. The prototype of indentation is your Shiot's tonometer, which is still widely being used in our part of the world. The main problem with Shiot's is that uh, it is influenced by ocular rigidity. So, in conditions when the rigidity is low, like in a myope, you may underestimate the IOP. Now, uh, the applanation tonometer, that is mainly Goldman applanation tonometer, which is a fixed area variable force tonometer. It is the most commonly used tonometer worldwide and considered as a gold standard based on the invert thick principle and the applanating diameter is 3.06 millimeters. Now, as you all know, it is a slit lamp mounted instrument. You have a biprism, which is the applanating area. Then there is a housing which has the weights and the adjustment node to adjust the force that you need to apply. Now, regarding the procedure, the points to remember are before you start, always make sure that the prism is clean. Then the blue filter should be applied with maximum light intensity, fully open. Magnification should be less at 10x and the start with a tension of 1 gram. Patient should be seated comfortably, aware of the procedure, cooperative and you look through the eyepiece, it's a uniocular measurement and what you see will be two semicircular myers uh, which are uh, uh, equal size. So the point is we have to make it, uh, we have to turn the tension loop so that the myers just get approximated. So these, when the inner edges of the myers get approximated, it is the end point of applanation. You can note down the reading, multiply it by 10, also note down the time. So if you see the myers too far apart, that means you need to increase the force. If they have already crossed, that means you need to reduce the force. Now, uh, error in Goldman mainly is due to the effect of corneal thickness. As you know, a thick cornea means you need more force to applanate it. So you may overestimate and a thin cornea or an edematous cornea, you need less force to implement and you may underestimate it. Various correction formulae are there but none are universally accepted but you should keep in mind that if the cornea is thin, uh, the optic nerve is susceptible even if the IOP is in the normal range. Then corneal astigmatism, more than 4 diopters can affect your Goldman readings. Then understanding too much of dye or too less of dye, asymmetry of myers, irregular corneas, patient factors, birth holding, valve salva, tight collars, all this can affect. And of course, a poorly calibrated instrument. Always calibrate the tonometer at least once in three months or according to its use. Now, certain other tonometers which are also widely used, Perkins, it is same as Goldman, only thing is it is handheld and portable, so you can use in children and also people who can't be seated on the slit lamp. Then Tonopin also uses uh, the Makima principle, but it is handheld, portable, useful in irregular and edematous corneas and children. Then NCT is there in all ophthalmology clinics, but remember that you can use it as a screening tool, but the accuracy decreases with high IOPs. Then Pascal's DCT is a slit lamp mounted instrument using contour matching. So it is uh, less affected by corneal thickness and properties. So you can use it in thin corneas. Then rebound tonometer is very popular in the western world. It is handheld, portable with small area of uh, application, no topical anesthesia. can use it for uh, home tonometer even. Then transpalpebral tonometers are also available where you measure the IOP through the eyelids. But readings are not that accurate. Then 24 hour monitoring devices, triggerfish, contact lens and also implantable materials, these are all being researched. And in special situations like in children, eye care rebound if available is the best option or else Tonopin, Perkins or in an older child, Goldman. 
and also effective anesthetics. All anesthetics usually reduce IOP except ketamine and succinylcholine which may increase the IOP. Therefore, in irregular cornea, edematous cornea, going for tonopin pneumotonometers, thin cornea, post lasic eyes and all, Pascal's DCT is said to be ideal. Then in conclusion, I would like to say that in spite of having so many different tonometers, uh, for the routine diagnosis and management and follow-up of a person with glaucoma, Gleiman Appalachian Tonometry is still considered to be the ideal one. Thank you. Thank you, Lishmi, for your informative and elaborative talk about IOP. Um, to start a therapy for glaucoma, three IOP readings three times a day is preferable to start a therapy. But the ideal would be the diurnal IOP measurements. And if the IOP is more than 30 millimeter of mercury, reconfirm once again and start therapy. So as she said, the Goldman Applanation Tonometry is the gold standard. But the presence of IOP does not equate the diagnosis of glaucoma. Conversely, decreased IOP or normal IOP does not exclude the diagnosis of glaucoma. Now I invite Dr. Gagi Satish, Professor, GMC Kottayam, for her talk on optic disc analysis in glaucoma. Over to you, Gagi. Thank you so much. Going to my topic, which is optic disc analysis in glaucoma. Now you all know that a glaucoma being an optic neuropathy, the structural damage visible as optic nerve head and peripapillary changes precede the functional damage like perimetry changes. How do you evaluate any sort of ophthalmoscopy will do, but the slit lamp biomicroscopy with its good stereopsis and magnification is the best. Use a similar method every time and do it with pupil dilated. A stereo photograph of the optic nerve head is a very useful tool. It gives an objective record as well as we can compare on follow up. But more than that, all of you may have seen that some abnormalities like RNFL defects, splinter hemorrhages, etc. may actually be picked up by a photograph than on our clinical examination. Now think of the optic nerve head or analyze the optic nerve head under the following headings. You keep it systematically so that you don't miss out on anything. So first is the disc size which is very important because the size of the disc will determine the size of the cup, the cup disc ratio and the neuroretinal rim. So if it's an average size disc, the ESINT rule etc. Uh, will stand good. But if it's a large disc, the cup is also going to be large and we may uh, overdiagnose glaucoma. Similarly, you all know that in small disc, even the slightest enlargement of the cup could be glaucomatous and we may underdiagnose glaucoma. So, disc size is a uh, parameter which should always be kept in your mind. And with experience, we can always understand what type of a disc it is. Now, this uh, um, with the advent of OCT, we don't usually do it, but still you can know that if you have a Hackstreet model with this graticule, you can easily measure off the size of the disc and multiply it with a correction factor for the lens used. Similarly, uh, the direct of thelmoscope Welsh line 5 degree aperture has a diameter of 1.5 millimeters and you can compare the disc size with that and classify the disc. Another thing which you should keep in mind is that the disc itself could be asymmetric between the two eyes which can result in a cup asymmetry and we may again misdiagnose glaucoma. So that has also got to be kept in mind and looked for and documented. The shape of the disc is classically vertically oval and all our rules like the isn't rule stands good in such a shape. So any abnormality in shape like in myopes, tilted disc, all these all our usual rules are not valuable and you may have to probe in further to diagnose glaucoma. So you have to document abnormal shapes also. Now, the cup. You all know the contour is more important than pal uh, the color etc. And how do you know the contour? It is by observing the blood vessels. So the blood vessels take two turns. One is at the uh, bottom and that one is at the top and that second kink is the edge of the cup. So that is the contour of the cup. And this is the age-old classic teaching which uh, according to me stands very good. 
with a CD ratio more than 0.6, deep excavated cups and an asymmetry between the two eyes of more than or equal to 0.2 to definitely suspect glaucoma. Now the most important parameter is the neuroretinal rim and the disc being vertically oval and the cup being horizontally oval slightly displaced upwards gives us the classic ascent rule which, is, which everybody knows. Now the NRR loss actually occurs sequentially usually infrotemporal then suprotemporal then the temporal is totally gone and finally we are left with a nasal remnant of the NRR. Sometimes it can be a diffuse sort of loss with a concentric enlargement and we may get confused is it a large physiological some sort of a preferential loss as well as ascent rule violation usually occurs. Focal loss is a characteristic notching. We have to look out for it, especially in a shallow cup. Then only we sometimes see notching. And uh, in a deep cup it is easy. And usually again in the infrotemporal and suprotemporal aspect, we see notching. Color is very important. Any pallor of the neuroretinal rim, think outside glaucoma. Usually, a neurological cause has to be suspected. The retinal nerve fiber layer, then never forget the RNFL. Uh, you can beautifully see the defects of RNFL if you look for it under red free. And a localized RNFL defect is highly specific for glaucomatous optic nerve damage. And they are more commonly encountered in the normal tension group. It could be wedge shaped or slit defects. And the slit has to be broader than the blood vessels to actually call it a defect because it can occur physiologically too. And again in the suprotemporal and infrotemporal where they are the thickest that is where the defects are also seen. And RNFL defects are sensitive indicators of early optic nerve damage and they can be seen before the disc changes or the notching etc. And hence much before perimetry changes. So that is why they are important. They, so look out for them in the areas of notching. And if you see hemorrhages, 6 to 8 weeks after the hemorrhages, you may see an RNFL defect rising there. If in later stages there is a diffuse loss, the blood vessels will start looking more prominent and the papillomacular bundle which is affected last will appear very bright. Hemorrhages on the disc are very important. Splinter hemorrhages perpendicular to disc margin within one disc diameter. Again, these findings were very common in the normal tension group. They are transient usually around 12 weeks and then they disappear and they indicate a progressive glaucomatous damage. If you see a disc hemorrhage, it means the disease is not under control. And in an ocular hypertension patient, it is a positive predictive factor for the development of POAG. Peripapillary atrophy, don't forget the distinctive central zone beta and the peripheral zone alpha which again is more prominent in the NTG group. Then these signs nobody usually misses, but look out for bayonetting or the double angulation. Look out for the bearing on the top picture, you see the circumlinear and then the bottom the uh, vessel has been bared. Look out for an overpass cupping, the typical nasalization, laminar dot sign and finally the large bean pot cupping. Usually all my PGs write these classic signs, but the Initial important steps are usually missed. So, systematically analyze the optic nerve head to reach the decision. Is it glaucoma or not glaucoma? Whether we have to start treating or alter the treatment? Is it progressing or stable? Or even Thomas Sir said, we may find out other causes of the field effects and OCT defects like a toxoplasma scar he was showing. So, the decision solely rests on you. Remember always, you are the boss, your clinical assessment is the best. Don't totally depend on machines or computers, they are just there to help you. Thank you so much. Thank you Dr. Gagi for the talk, excellent talk on optic disc analysis. And thank you for enlightening us uh, for the information that the examiner is the boss, not the machines. Thank you. I invite Dr. Sarita VK, Professor of uh, Ophthalmology, <coughs> Government Medical College, Kottayam, for his uh, her talk on gonioscopy. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, madam. The topic is gonioscopy. Straight away, coming to the indications. Basically, it is to differentiate an open angle from a closed angle.
and to study the topography of the angle and also use for therapeutic purposes. A word about the principle, normally we cannot visualize the angle structures due to total internal reflection at the cornea air interface. Coming to the principle, it, the gonioscope changes cornea air in interface to lens air interface, changing the critical angle, thus permitting the view of the angle. There are two types of gonioscopy, direct and indirect. With direct lenses, the, len the light is refracted from the angle is observed directly and we get an erect image. With indirect lenses, the light is reflected by a mirror within the lens and an inverted image is obtained. We usually do indirect gonioscopy and this is the standard procedure. As I told, with indirect lenses, the images views viewed are reversed by 180, but the right-left orientation remains the same. From the figure, you can see that the pigmentation at the 12 o'clock is seen at the inferior mirror at the 6 o'clock position, but the PA is seen on the same side. These are the indirect gonio lenses, Goldman. We usually use Goldman two mirror lens, which has got a flange and it is used for manipulative gonioscopy also. These Z's, Posner and Sussman, they are mainly used for indentation. Regarding the procedure, the key points are the gonioscopy should be preferably done in a dimly lit room. Regarding slit lamp adjustments, there should be minimum illumination initially and with 10x magnification, use a thin short slit beam. The purpose is it should not cross the pupillary border producing meiosis and which can artifactually open up a narrow angle. First of all, you have to explain the procedure to the patient after anesthetizing and filling the lens with the viscoelastic. You can examine the lens for any bubbles or oil marks or scratches. Then the slit lamp adjustment is made. You have to reduce the slit beam and ask the patient to look upwards, pull the lower lid slightly down and place the lens. You can see we are supporting the gonio lens with two fingers and the third finger is used as a support to the headband. Then first of all you have to focus the inferior angle in the superior mirror because that is the widest angle. Grade the angle then you can increase the illumination you can broaden the slit beam and look for the final details. As you all know this is the normal angle anatomy starting from the Schwalbe's line anteriorly the non-pigmented and pigmented trabecular meshwork, scleral spur, ciliary body band and finally the root of the iris. So what is an occludable angle? When the non-pigmented trabecular meshwork is see, not seen in three quadrants of the angle, in the, without indentation or manipulation in the primary position, it is called an occludable angle. The corneal wedge can be used to, the apex can be used to identify a Schwalbe's line so that we can differentiate a pigmented Schwalbe's line from the trabecular meshwork. This, what about manipulative gonioscopy? It is done with Goldman lens and useful in convex iris configuration and over the hill view is obtained in a narrow angle and the patient is asked to look towards the mirror and the mirror is tilted towards the angle being viewed. Coming to indentation, we usually do with Zeiss or Sussman lens, which has got the same radius of curvature as that of the cornea. The apex is indented and we can differentiate an appositional closure from a synechal closure. This is the procedure of doing indentation. This is a closed angle. We can see after indentation, the angle is opening up. Coming to the disadvantages, these indirect lenses require a coupling medium, it has got a mirror image and inadvertent pressure can open or close the angle. These are the direct gonioscopy lenses. The advantages are we get an erect panoramic view which is relevant for surgical procedures. There are different angle grading systems. 
The most popular and usually used is the Schaffer system, which is based on the angular width of the angle recess. And when the angular recess is less than 20 degree, there is a chance of closure of the angle. How do we represent angle structures? We represent angle structures by the most posterior structure seen first in the primary position and then on, then on manipulation or indentation. We can also represent the trabecular pigmentation, convexity of the iris or peripheral prominent role of the iris and subtle features like peripheral anterior sinecae or new vessels in the angle. This is the representation of the goniogram. You can uh, record the finer details like NVA, goniosinecae and peripheral anterior sinecae. What are the contraindications for gonioscopy? If there is acute trauma to the globe, bulle, ocular surface infection and epithelial defect. There are some of the gonioscopic findings. Iris process are fine filiform. They don't obstruct the underlying structures and follow the contour. Unlike peripheral anterior sinicae, which are broader, ten-shaped and obscure the angle details. The new vessels, they are fine, arborizing and crosses the scleral spur. We can see the double hump sign on plato iris, pigment dispersion, concave iris configuration, sample C line and a homogeneous dense pigment. In pseudo exfoliation, there is patchy pigmentation of the trabecular meshwork. This is the prominent Schwalbe's line in accent field rigor. And iridia, there is anteriorly displaced rudimentary stump of the iris. These are the irregular pigmented uh, widening of the trabecular meshwork in angle recession. Also, we can make out cyclodialysis and foreign body in the angle. Don't remember to check the patency of the ostium after trabeculectomy. Cleaning, usually we clean with soap and water. The take home message is, in ideal conditions, gonioscopy should be done routinely for all patients above 40 years. It is a must before making a diagnosis of glaucoma and repeat gonioscopy at regular intervals during follow-up of your cases. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sadida, for your uh, elaborate but uh, basic things how to do a gonioscopy. Because gonioscopy is critical in the diagnosis of all forms of glaucomas, which will give an information about the uh, increased intraocular tension and also it is critical to see the potential causes uh, determination of therapy so for therapy as well as cause of increased IOP you can find out by gonioscopy so all general ophthalmologists should know how to do a gonioscopy now I invite Dr. Nishi for the presentation on visual field evaluation Good afternoon everyone. I will be discussing on a visual field evaluation in glaucoma. See, we have both static and dynamic perimetry to evaluate the visual field which is a an island of vision in a sea of darkness. Uh, presently, kinetic perimetry is almost obsolete. So, I will be discussing the visual field uh, interpretation under the following head headings in the subsequent field slides. So, the first zone we have the basic data which includes the patient data as well as the test data. Patient data includes the age which is a very important factor because the machine uh, compares the uh, uh, values corresponding to a normal, a normal of that particular age. If you uh, enter the age wrong, then the whole uh, test will be wrong. Interpretation of the whole test will be wrong. Then you have the refraction. Both near as well as distant refraction has to be corrected. The eye which is being tested has to be mentioned. Pupil size ideally has to be between uh, 3 and 4. And if you mention it in all the subsequent tests, it's easy if you find any variations in the field which does not correspond to the disc. Now, usually we go for the CETAS FAST 24-2 program in glaucoma. But for the first field, you can always do a 30-2. The stimulus size is usually 3. But in advanced glaucomas, when a macular program is being done, we can go for the size 5. Next is your reliability criteria, which includes the fixation losses. And fixation losses is mainly uh, tested using the blind spot. So, 5% of the stimuli will be given to the blind spot during the test. In this picture, we can see the eye uh, deviating up and corresponding to it. In the gaze tracker, you can see an upward deviation. So, it shouldn't uh, exceed 20 percentage. False positive error is a condition where we have a trigger happy patient 
who gives a response to a non presented stimuli again it shouldn't exceed 33 and false negative it is a condition where the patient respond does not respond to a brighter stimuli uh, to which a threshold much lower to that has been recorded so that also shouldn't be more than 33 and usually in advanced glaucomas you get a high false negative errors foveal threshold has to be mentioned and if it is low the rest of the threshold is also likely to be low so if a patient has good visual acuity and at the same time you find a low foveal threshold you have not corrected the refractive error properly and this is the next zone which is the raw data which shows the correct decibel units at each point and it can be converted into a gray scale it has no significance in diagnosing glaucoma but but we can explain we can use the gray scale to show the patient how much of uh, field loss has occurred next you have the total deviation plot which has a numerical value as well as an easy for an easy interpretation you have the probability plot so that shows the total depression in the field it can be due to a cataract or it can, both cataract and glaucoma will be included in that but when you go to the pattern deviation it is more selective of a localized uh, vision loss within the uh, total deviation which is more uh, predictive of a glaucomatous change now these are the uh, global indices mean deviation is actually a deviation uh, from the normative data so if you have a negative value it means that it is uh, much uh, lesser than the normal if it is positive means that it is better than the normal value so it it is actually a decrease in the hill of vision that is a generalized depression in field but if you have a, a psd which is high that is more indicative of a glaucomatous change and visual field index is something that is shown in percentage and it will also tell you in how many years or at what age the patient is going to be absolutely blind this is again the first one shows the uh, change in the corner that is a dip that this is a localized loss which is likely to be specific for glaucoma the next one is actually a, the shape is the same that the contour is normal but the height has come down so uh, it mean deviation will be high in this can be due to cataract and all now this is a hemifield test which is important in glaucoma where uh, five zones uh, uh, one on the upper and one on the lower zone which are mirror images are evaluated to assess whether it is outside normal limits model line etc now uh, this is the criteria to diagnose uh, glaucoma uh, in which says that there should be three criteria either three or more non-edge points see this is a 30 dash uh, field that is shown below in a 30 dash field we should eliminate the peripheral points only the three uh, non-edge points which, uh, which are in the area which is typical for glaucoma with a p less than five and at least one with a p value less than one percentage with a G, uh, glaucoma hemifield test outside normal limits and a PST with a p-value less than 5 is present on two consecutive fields that is important that will help you in diagnosing I'll also mention one more criteria that in the HODAP classification even though it includes two more criteria which is more elaborate at least you can look into the mean deviation and if it is in the range up to minus 6 you can say it is early glaucomatous and if it is a moderate damage it has to be between uh, minus 6 and 12 and it's above 12 means it's an advanced glaucomatous loss and if you get a high mean deviation above 20 you won't get the pattern deviation plot also this is the glaucoma progression analysis and this has two pages first page is the uh, is what is shown on the right side which is the baseline fields that is the machine will select two baseline fields and based on that only the subsequent fields will be analyzed so in the below that you can see the mean deviation slope this slope includes the mean deviation of the baseline as well as the subsequent fields that have been assessed and you get a p-value p corresponding to that also so then you go to the next page which is the follow up page which has a gray scale then the pattern deviation and the next one is the deviation from the previous baseline of the present field and in the end you have the last column which has some unique symbols which uh, pictorically helps you in diagnosing the progression and in the end you have uh, you can analyze whether there, you, there is a plain language interpretation showing whether there is possible or likely progression so these are the open triangle showing uh, a change in one field and if it is half field triangle there are two consecutive fields showing changes and the third one if you have a closed triangle it is there on three fields see uh, these are some of the glaucomatous field effects showing the nasal step then the arcuate scotoma so there's a temporal island and only central field and this is a macula split these are some of the artifacts one is the rim artifact 
and this is an abnormally high false uh, fixation losses due to a downward shift in the blind spot. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nishi, for the concise presentation of an elaborate topic. I would like to emphasize that don't interpret a single field in isolation. You, you have to take two to three fields and the findings should be consistent and it should co correlate with your disk findings. Then only you can say that field effect is present or not. Thank you. Now we have um, Dr. Roshi, a senior consultant in glaucoma service, Chaitanya Hospital, Trivandrum, for her talk on um, retinal nerve fiber layer analysis. Thank you, Vijay Mama. Thank you, Sarada Mama, Team Kotem, my teachers, for this opportunity. Let's see the role of retinal nerve fiber layer analysis in glaucoma diagnosis. So why RNFL analysis? We all know structural changes may precede perimetric changes, and RNFL analysis is extremely sensitive for detecting preperimetric glaucoma, glaucoma suspects, excluding physiological cupping, and is useful for monitoring disease progression as well. So clinically, RNFL is evaluated under the SITLAM using the 90D lens under the red-free filter. Normally, it is seen as alternating dark and bright striations. When there is RNFL loss, there will be diffuse loss or slits or wedge defects. RNFL analysis can be done by scanning laser polarimetry or OCT. OCT is preferred. So OCT RNFL evaluates the structural damage, as I mentioned. And it's non-invasive, objective, and rapid and gives a quantitative measurement of the thickness of the RNFL and compares with the normative database also. Principle is optical interferometry, but newer OCT machines use a spectrometer. Time domain OCT came first, followed by the spectral domain OCT, and swept source OCT is the newer addition. Spectral domain OCT is the device most commonly used in clinical practice now, and the commonly used devices are the Spectralis and the Cirrus. The scanning protocols and segmentation algorithms are different, so the measurements are not e easily interchangeable. And each device has its own age-matched normative database, and the age range in Cirrus machine is 18 to 84 years, and the refractory error is minus 12 to plus 8 diopter, and in Spectralis it is minus 6 and plus 6, and an astigmatism of 2 diopters. The peripapillary RNFL thickness, as we all know, is the most popular OCT parameter used and spectralis measures this directly with a 3.46 mm diameter circular scan centered on the opted disc. And the cirrus, it, uh, this measurement is generated from a 6 mm cube scan centered on the opted disc. Interpretation, the general rules, RNFL thickness display in the printout is both quantitative as well as color coded. Green is normal, yellow is borderline and red is abnormal. White is uh, seen when there is thick RNFL and also when the normative database is not available. Gray is also uh, indicated when the normative database is not available. Uh, our average RNFL thickness and the inferior quadrant thickness are the most clinically relevant RNFL parameters and a difference of more than 9 micrometer in average RNFL thickness between two eyes is suggestive of early glaucomatous damage and RNFL thickness also follows the ISND rule and violation of this can be indicative of glaucoma. But if there is a nasal and temporal quadrant thinking, uh, thinning, we have to think of the possibility of non-glaucomatous optic neuropathy also. So this is a spectralis RNFL analysis printout. A good printout will have a uh, good quality uh, scan will have a um, uh, uh, have a go good um, disc picture uh, and uh, RNFL uh, displayed clearly. And uh, the printout gives a uh, BMO centered OCT scan of the RNFL, which is seen by these bright green circles. And this circle is an unrolled and gives a horizontal OCT uh, scan which gives the uh, circumpapillary RNFL in a single shot. And this circumpapillary RNFL is displayed in a TSNIT order generating the TSNIT thickness profile which has a double hump pattern because of the uh, superior and inferior RNFL being the thickest. So RNFL classification charts in the spectralis gives the average RNFL thickness for the global 360 degrees for the four quadrants as well as additional four sectors and the print uh, and the measurements are displayed uh, 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 in a color coded manner with green being within normal limits yellow borderline and uh, red being outside normal limits so this is a serious printout and the quality or signal strength of more than 6 is good and the key parameters are displayed in a uh, table and which gives the average rnfl thickness of both eyes rnfl uh, symmetry between both eyes and optic nerve head data also 
So other features of the uh, Cirrus printout are the Arnafil thickness map, which has an hourglass pattern and is color coded blue is thinnest. The Arnafil uh, deviation map, which is based on the no which is compared with the Nomati database, again color coded with the warm colors being the thin Arnafil. Also gives the neuronal rim thickness profile, the TSNIT profile, the RNFL quadrant as well as the cloak over thickness which is matched to the Nomati database, the horizontal and vertical B scans and the RNFL calculation circle which gives the boundaries of the RNFL segmentation also. Though widely used, our OCT is not free from artifacts or pitfalls. Small opted disc, long axle length and older age are associated with thinner RNFL and RNFL thinning is also seen in non-glocomatous optic neuropathy. So clinical correlation is very important. A good medical history, clinical examination, photographs of the optic nerve head, visual field gives a good diagnostic yield along with the OCT RNFL. So few art artifacts, motion artifacts and blink artifacts are common. Both cause loss of data. And RNFL touching the floor is also artifactual because the thickness less than 40 microns is artifactual. And segmentation errors are also common which can be seen from the OCT scan. So another artifact is uh, decentration of the calculation circle. We can see the calculation circle is descended here when corrected the RNFL thickness comes out normal. Other artifacts are floater artifacts and machine related artifacts like smudges. OCT printouts in myopia should always be read with caution because normality data is not available for more than minus 12 diopter and peripapillary atrophy and tilted disc can go pseudo thinning of the RNFL as in this case. And floor effect, we all know the as a glaucoma advances, RNFL measurement continues to decrease, but it does not go to zero because of the floor effect. The reason being the architectural support by the molar cells, astroglia, and the blood vessels. And in spectralis, the average RNFL floor values range from 49.2 and in cirrus it is 57 microns but progression can still occur but cannot be detected by the RNFL OCT. So we should con consider macular OCT or 10-2 for progression advanced to glaucoma. Green disease occurs when small focal errors, uh, focal area, small focal areas of damage are shown up as green because the machine averages the thickness in that particular sector. And red disease occurs as the assessments made by uh, as the assessments are made by the computer software based on normative database. Measurements tend to fall outside normal uh, range in certain cases like myopia and non glaucomatous causes of RNFL thinning. Like in this case, this is a normal disc and normal visual field, but the OCT RNFL is showing an up showing an abnormal area. A few words on macular ganglion cell analysis. It is also possible with the OCT because the macular inner retinal layer is less affected than the peripapillary RNFL with the large areas of peripapillary atrophy or high myopia. And in myopia, this is helpful for diagnosis of early glaucoma. And finally, progression analysis. This is also available with the cirrus. Uh, uh, this gives both event and trend based comparison and differences of 7 micrometer or more for superior and inferior quadrants or more than 4 micrometer for average RNFL scans. Um, average RNFL between the scans is outside normal. Thank you. Thank you, Roshni, for your excellent talk. Now the session is open for discussion. OCT RNFL may play an important role in the diagnosis of and management of glaucoma and should be a part of an optic disc examination also. Thank you for the audience for making our uh, instruction course a success. Thank you.